Hello and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IAS. A very, very warm good morning to everyone. I hope all of you are doing good. I welcome you today to this session of the Hindu newspaper analysis. As you know, right here, sharp at 10 a.m., we start analyzing the day's newspaper by discussing the most important news stories from both the mains and the prelims examination point of view. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining in right on time. Before we begin the topics for today, a very, very important reminder, we are running a mega scholarship scheme and which there are a few seats that are on offer at 60% scholarship. All that you have to do is use the link given in the pinned comment and you would be taken there. Please do make sure that you take advantage of this ongoing initiative. Now, these are the topics that we have chosen for today. From the mains examination point of view, we will be discussing how the Supreme Court has validated the stand of the Tamil Nadu government on the Jalikatu issue. Second, we will be discussing whether or not now any spend that you do overseas through your credit cards, on your tools or any other purposes, would it be taxed or not? Because there was a news just a few days back that the government of India has decided that now if you spend money abroad, even through your credit card, above rupees 7 lakh, you'll have to pay an extra tax on that. Then we'll be discussing about how India is trying to improve its connectivity with Russia more specifically with the help of a project called INSTC, the International North-South Transport Corridor. How exactly is it helping India become better connected with Russia and Central Asia? Then from the prelims examination point of view, we will be discussing about first how Kerala is trying to ensure that their tourism market, especially the souvenirs, etc. are not in competition with China because a lot of Chinese products are being flooded in the Indian market. Then how the global polio targets won't be met this year because there are some countries where polio cases are increasing yet again. More specifically in our neighborhood, Pakistan, Afghanistan, the polio cases are coming up. Then we'll be discussing how WHO has said that even non-sugar sweeteners or artificial sweeteners, for example, the Diet Coke or sugar-free products that you have, how that also is not good for your health. And in the end, we'll be discussing how the Government of India cannot claim immunity for any contract just because the President of India is party to it. These are the topics that we will be discussing today. So let's begin without waiting any further. The first topic that we have here is a series of events about the Jalikatu festival in Tamil Nadu and how finally it has culminated into the Supreme Court again allowing it that yes, you can conduct this in the state of Tamil Nadu. Now, I'm sure all of you would know about Jalikatu. It is a traditional rural sport. So basically, it's a sport where some bulls are released, they are angry, they are running, and there are men who have to control these bulls. The ones who can control these bulls without falling off, they are the ones who are considered as winners. Now, what happened was, there was a lot of controversy about this sport for a long, long time. There were controversies because of two reasons. The first controversy was that it leads to cruelty amongst animals. That was a first controversy because in order for the bulls to actually start running, they were beaten up when they were locked up. People used to make them angry. They used to twist their tails so that as soon as the door opens, the bulls used to run with all their might. That was one issue that it leads to cruelty towards animals. The second issue is it also injures people who are playing the sport. So it also injures people who are playing or who are watching this. So these are the two things because of which at the end of the day, there have been multiple controversies about the Jalikatu as a sport, whether it should be allowed or not. Why is it in the news? It is in the news because Supreme Court has finally now decided that yes, this sport should be allowed in Tamil Nadu. They are happy with the rules and regulations made by the Tamil Nadu Assembly. Supreme Court said that we agree that this is a part of their culture, they can continue and they do not really have to prohibit it. The Supreme Court said that we are happy with the regulations and the laws that are put in place now. Now, this is a verdict that is not just valid for Jalikatu, it is also valid for similar kind of sports that are played in other parts of South India. For example, there is a Kambala that is Buffalo Rays again. If you have seen uh, the Kantara movie, you would have seen there is a proper sequence where this buffalo race is shown. There are many similar kind of sports that are seen in South India and all of them are now allowed by the Supreme Court by this verdict. Now, if you look at one by one, how exactly is it that this incident played out? 
what happened first, why was it banned earlier, let's try and see that one by one. So in 2006, it started with Madras High Court. Now Madras High Court, there was a single judge bench. A single judge bench of Madras High Court prohibited the conduct of such sports. There was a single judge bench in Madras. She said that no, this sport should not be allowed because it is leading to cruelty of animals. Now, as you know, there are certain high courts in India, including the Madras High Court, where you can challenge the decision of a single judge in the same high court, where it will be heard by a division bench. I hope all of you know what is a division bench. So in some high courts across the country, including the Madras High Court, if one single judge gives the decision, you can challenge the decision in the same high court. Just that that decision will now be heard or the case will be heard by multiple judges. That will be called a division bench. So this single judge decision of the Madras High Court was challenged in Madras High Court only, heard by a division bench, that is multiple judges. They set aside the order, but they asked the government of Tamil Nadu to take steps to prevent any kind of cruelty. So this is what happened in 2006. One judge banned it and the multiple judges said, okay, we are not banning it, but you regulate it. Second, 2009, the assembly of Tamil Nadu started making laws to ensure that there are regulations put in place for this sport. They thought that now they will not have a problem with it. But again, 2011, at this time, the union ministry issued an order that you cannot have these kind of sports. In 2011, Union Ministry of Environment and Forest issued a notification saying that bulls are one of those animals that cannot be trained for any performance. Because of this, the organization of this event became very irregular for many years. The state of Tamil Nadu could not organize any of these sports. Now, very soon after that, it also started becoming a kind of a political issue. Because what happened was, there was this incident happening or where people in Tamil Nadu started protesting that whoever is in support of this prohibition, we will not vote for them. So every political party started also thinking about the point of view from the vote, whether they would be able to please the people, whether they would vote for them or not. Then 2014, 2014, the Supreme Court said that we are imposing a proper ban on Jalika to and similar sports. Why? The Supreme Court has said that the WHO talks about five fundamental freedoms that have to be given to animals as well. First, freedom from hunger, thirst and malnutrition. Second, freedom from fear and distress. Third, the freedom from physical and thermal discomfort. Fourth, freedom from pain, injury and disease. And fifth, freedom to express normal patterns of behavior. These are the five freedoms that have been recognized by WHO as well as fundamental to any animal. The Supreme Court of India also said that these kind of freedoms are being curtailed in sports such as Ajalika 2 and that is why we are banning it. So 2014, the Supreme Court banned this. Now, after the Supreme Court banning it, obviously people did not like it. Many people thought it's a part of our ancient culture. We don't want the Supreme Court or the government to interfere because the idea of the people was that it's not being forced upon anyone. Only those who want to participate are participating in it. And because it's going on for such a long time, we should not be allowed or we should not be forced to give up this kind of a tradition. Now, in response to the Supreme Court decision of 2014, banning it properly, in 2017, there was an agitation in the state of Tamil Nadu. There were many people who came out on the street saying that we want the, the Jalikadu sport to be organized once again. Because of that, the Tamil Nadu government then thought that we would like to introduce a new law to override the Supreme Court decision. So what the Tamil Nadu government did, they took permission from the president, issued an ordinance. Under the ordinance, the Supreme Court verdict was reversed and Jalika 2 was again put into place. Oops. Just a second. Yeah. Once again, the Jalika 2 was put into place after the Tamil Nadu government released an ordinance with the help of prior permission from the President of India. The Tamil Nadu government also said that we are making sure that the bulls will not be harassed, there will be no cruelty. Apart from this, the ordinance made a specific change in the Prevention of Cruelty Act. In this act, the ordinance specifically made an exception 
for Jalika 2, where Jalika 2 was allowed, there were words that were changed. As a result of which, since 2017, Jalika 2 has again been operational. There was this case filed in the Supreme Court once again. This is a verdict that has come out. Now the Supreme Court has said, okay, we agree with what the Tamil Nadu state has done. We don't have a problem. We are happy with the regulation that they have put in place. So now we are allowing the Jalika 2 as a sport to go ahead. This is the entire story. It starts in 2006 when the Madras High Court bans it. Then the Tamil Nadu government trying to overturn it. Supreme Court again banning it in 2014. But now the Supreme Court has said that, okay, we are happy with what steps the Tamil Nadu government is taking. We won't ban it, but we want it to be regulated. But over here, I would also like to tell you what exactly are the constitutional provisions for the welfare of animals in India? What is it that the law says? How can we ensure that animal welfare is given a topmost priority? There are certain articles in the Indian constitution that apply to animals as well. For example, article number 48A, it says it is responsible, the state is responsible to ensure that the strength of the animals is improved and they safeguard the wildlife of the country. As you know, this is a part of directed principles of the state policy. Article 51A, which is a part of fundamental duties, says it is a duty of every citizen to protect and improve forest and wildlife and have a compassion for all the living creatures. The Supreme Court has also said that Article 21 that provides us the right to life and personal liberty also applies to animals as well. So <clears throat> there are multiple provisions in the Constitution of India in different parts as we can see in part 3 of the Constitution that is fundamental rights, part 4 that is active principles and part 4a also it is fundamental duties. All of them talking about what are the rights of the animals. Now also the PCA or the prevention of cruelty to animals is a very old law in India. It was a law introduced in 1960. It was recently, government tried to amend it recently. They tried to make some important changes in the law. Why? As you would remember a few months back, there were many news stories that came out that many people, some people threw a dog from the third floor and made a video out of it. Some people just tied a dog to their car and they started just uh, running the car. So there were many instances of people conducting cruelty against animals. The law was not strict enough. The original law that was about the prevention of cruelty against animals said that the only fine that you have to give was 50 rupees, 5-0. Just imagine the original law was if you have or if you conduct or show cruelty to any animal, the only fine that you have to give is 50 rupees, nothing more than that. So that had to be changed. So the government of India introduced some amendments. For example, now the punishment is from 50,000 to 75,000. You also have a punishment for killing an animal that is maximum five years in jail. You also have punishments for gruesome cruelty, which leads to extreme pain of animals. And also cruelty to animals has now been considered as a cognizable offense. Cognizable offense in simple term means serious offenses for which a person can be arrested without even a warrant. So without in a warrant, the person, for example, murder, all these kind of cases are very serious. So you don't have to wait for a warrant. Those are cognizable offenses. This has also now become a cognizable offense and the person can be arrested in such a case even without the warrant being there. This was our first topic for the day. <clears throat> Kishna Singh, SC can initiate a plebiscite? No, I'll stop your question right here. In India, we don't believe in the concept of plebiscite. So I wouldn't even read your question. We don't have a plebiscite because if you conduct plebiscite, what is the need of the government or the Supreme Court? If you conduct a plebiscite asking whether Supreme, whether Salman Khan is guilty or not of killing an animal, what do you think the people will say, right or wrong? So if you conduct everything by a plebiscite, what is the need of a Supreme Court? Then... Uh, Chiku Bard and planning are banning are the same things. Then, um, Mangal Deep is saying ordinance can be issued on any verdict of the Supreme Court. So, understand this: there are different types of verdicts of the Supreme Court. Let's say the Supreme Court gives a verdict in which they said that one person is guilty because he or she committed an offense, right? Those kind of things can't be overturned because 
when you say the government is overturning the decision, what you are trying to say is government is making a new law actually. That is over and above the law of the Supreme Court. Because whatever the Supreme Court said, the government made one more law over it and that is how it exists. So in those kind of cases where the Supreme Court is deciding whether a person is guilty or not of a certain offense, you can't override that. But when the Supreme Court gives those kind of decisions that will now be a part of law moving forward, let's say the Supreme Court said that services will now be under Delhi government. So that's a law that will apply now moving forward. Those kind of things can be reversed through ordinance. So then it, has, it happens a very common thing. Every government does it. Then I have a question, <clears throat> present instance of Supreme Court, Ilma, that is what we discussed. The topic is in the news because Supreme Court has allowed Jali Kathu to go forward. Kulungkum is saying, can you explain again about the five freedoms? Kulungkum is written right here. I am not sure what is to explain here. These are the things. Freedom from hunger, I am not sure if you want me to explain what is hunger or what is fear. <laughs> These are right here written for you. Not sure if there is something to explain right here. Okay, I'll take one or two more. Um, doesn't Supreme Court over destroy the animal rights by the decision? See, there, any Supreme Court decision that comes in, it's not that every person will be in agreement to that. You may not agree with it, it's absolutely fine. You may, not, you may say that, no sir, I don't agree with this, I think the animal rights are being compromised. You can. It's not that you have to agree with their reasoning. This is what they have decided. They have said that the regulations put in place by Tamil Nadu government, regulations such as banning people from conducting any cruelty to world's boards. So they are happy with that, that it's fine. So it depends really upon what exactly is the Supreme Court's decision. You may or may not agree with it. That's absolutely fine. Let's go ahead then. The second article that we have here is about a recent order given by the government because of which there was a lot of debate in the society and the government has again gone back on the order. Now what exactly is the order all about? In simple terms the order was that now if you go abroad and you spend money through credit cards. Let's say you go abroad, you spend money through credit cards. If you spend over 7 lakh rupees, if you spend over 7 lakh rupees through credit cards, you have to pay an extra tax and that will be 20%. That was the big headline of the new decision by the government. That you're traveling abroad, you spend money for anything by credit cards, you have to pay 20%. So that means your traveling abroad or you visiting abroad will become much costlier. Now, when the government came up with this decision, there was a lot of debate in the uh, society. A lot of people said across the country, this is not good. And this is why the government of India finally took back the order. Now please understand, this is not something that has happened all of a sudden. The government did announce this in the budget as well. In this year's budget, the government did say that we are planning to increase taxes on foreign spends. But now the government has introduced rules about it. Now before we go ahead, you have to understand there is something called LRS. LRS means Liberalized Remittance Scheme. Let me write it here for you. There's liberalized remittance scheme. Basically, in simple terms, how much money as an Indian are you allowed to send outside the country? How much money are you allowed to take outside? So that limit for LRS is 2.5 lakh dollar per year. So you can take 2.5 lakh dollar per year. So if you roughly convert it into Indian rupees, roughly close to 2 crore rupees. That's a rough conversion. So close to 2 crore rupees you can spend outside under the LRS. Now what has happened is if you actually spend money just by going outside on a tour on a package you did not really have to pay extra taxes. But now the government has changed this. Government has said if you book an overseas tour package. Let's say if you are visiting abroad and you want to book a package earlier you had to pay a tax of 5% that has now increased to 20%. TCS means, any idea what is TCS? The TCS tax, think about it, I'll go ahead till then. So the TCS tax has been increased on overseas tour packages from 5% to 20%. Not just this, the government also said that if you are spending over 7 lakhs on credit cards annually, 
you will attract a 20% tax. Earlier it used to be 5%. Now that has also increased from 5% to 20%. Yes. TCS, as many people have said, it's tax collected on source. Tax collected on source. Meaning that, let's say, if you buy something from a company, the company will cut taxes also and they will deposit the tax with the government. So the source is the place from where you are buying the stuff. You buy the stuff, you pay the money, you pay the taxes also to them and then they will deposit those taxes with the government. So earlier, if you had to spend over 7 lakh rupees in one year in the foreign country, you had to pay 5% tax on that. Now it has increased to 20% tax. The government has said the reason why they have done it is, government says it is difficult to track credit card transactions. Government says that in the LRS scheme, we were not able to count credit card transactions. We were only able to count how much money have you transferred from your bank account to bank account or your debit card. But because the government wants to track credit card transactions of the people as well, this is why they have increased the tax from 5% to 20% now. The government is saying that no, it will not impact a lot of people because anyways who are going outside, anyways who are traveling outside India are not really poor people. That is the argument from the side of the government. That number one, they want to track all the credit card transactions as well, which was not happening earlier. And secondly, they also have to make sure that they have enough revenue. And the government says that this class of people who are going outside India who are visiting outside India, they can afford to pay even a 20% levy on that as well. Now, their argument is first, if you just want to track transactions, then 20% tax is too much just to track transactions. Because if you just want to track transactions, how many people are or how much money are you spending outside, you could also have 2% or 5% tax that would ensure that the government can track all the transactions. So just to track transactions, if you have to put a trail, that doesn't mean you have to put 20% taxes, number one. Second problem here is you are making it very difficult for people to travel outside the country. This is also something that goes against a liberal government policy. A liberal government policy should be that you should allow people to travel wherever they want. But if you actually put such a high tax here, the logic behind this is why the countries around the world put a limit on how much money you can spend outside the country is the countries usually fear that you will take away the foreign exchange. Every country, including India, has foreign exchange reserves. We don't want those foreign exchange reserves to reduce drastically. The countries put a limit on how much tax or how much money you can remit outside the country in one year, like the LRS that we have, because the government does not want you to spend a lot of money outside. For example, right now, India's foreign exchange reserve is close to $600 billion. This is close, this is lump sum India's foreign exchange reserves. So the argument is if Indians are allowed to spend as much money overseas as they want without any limit, without any taxes, then maybe India's foreign exchange reserve will start to come down. That is why under the LRS, we have a 2.5 lakh dollar limit only. Also, please remember, the government of India has taken this decision back. That is why it is in the news. They took that decision about three days back. Then they saw the people did not like it. The government has taken back the decision once again. So now we are back to the original 5% tax on over 7 lakhs spent on credit card in one year abroad. The government of India take, took back that particular decision. The LRS, that is the liberalized remittance scheme, as I said, allows you to spend about 2.5 lakh dollar per year outside the country. Lump sum close to 2 crores. Now the problem here is, in some cases, let's say if you are going for education abroad without any scholarship to very expensive colleges, you might have to spend more than 2 crores in a year. Or if you are going for a very expensive surgery, you also might have to spend more than 2 crores in a year. So how do you do that? Usually people, that is why they send some money in one financial year, then they send some more money in the next financial year. That is how the people actually segregate their spending. If they have to spend more money, more than the limit given, they actually segregate it over the years so that they can buy property or they can get surgery or they can go to school or college outside. So the decision has been taken back so far. This is what the LRS is all about. So far, the fears of the government 
that because Indians are spending so much money outside, our forex reserves will come down so much, so far, that fear of the government has not come down to be true. Despite the Indian people spending a lot of money outside on tourism, etc., India's foreign exchange reserves are still very solid, close to $600 billion. It's not that our foreign reserves are decreasing just because of that. That was our second article for the day. Okay. Let me see. Nil, uh, the 2.5 lakh limit, if you're asking that, yes, it's applicable to everyone. The 2.5 lakh limit is applicable to everyone. The 7 lakh limit of credit card, that does not apply to students. Then we have a question. Kishan is saying, Kishan, how is it double taxation? You are not paying taxes on it in India. Akshay is saying different between TCS and LRS. Akshay, these are two separate things altogether. LRS is a scheme under which the government says an Indian can only send 2.5 lakh dollars in one year. Nothing more than that. TCS means whatever money you spend outside on that also government does put some taxes. That is called TCS tax collected at source. You can, uh, you can file for a IT return, etc. But that money will come in later on. Rahul, credit card, see, okay, just to clarify, when we are saying, talking about these rules, credit card expenditures, etc. This was taxed earlier as well. Earlier also, there was a tax of 5% maximum on over 7 lakh was spent on credit card in one year. Now they have just increased it from 5% to 20%. That is a change. Why credit cards now? Because government says it is difficult to track credit card transactions. Government says that people use their credit cards and we don't really count that in LRS. So government says in the LRS limit, that is the 2 crore rupees limit, we have to count credit card transactions as well. For that, we are putting taxes on credit cards also so that we can track those transactions. That is the idea that the government has. That is, they would, they would have it easier to now track the credit card transactions. The next article that we have here is on a project that you would have heard about many times, but unfortunately, it has remained mostly on paper rather than being implemented on the ground. This is something called INSTC. The INSTC is International North-South Transport Corridor. Let me first quickly show you a photo and then we'll come back. If you see here, the idea is right now, if India has to bring some products from Russia, right now, if this is Russia, this blue route that you see, this is the current route. So right now, if some product comes from Russia to India, this is the route that they take. So it takes a lot more time. It actually is much more expensive for the country as well. On the other hand, what we are trying to do is we are trying to have an alternated route to it. And the red one that the red route that you see will be an alternate to it. It will end here at the Mumbai port. This is the entire idea from Russia. We'll come till Mo India. Now the countries that are in between, they will also get advantage. They will also get better connectivity, better infrastructure. This is the idea of INSTC. But the problem here is the INSTC project first started in the year 2000 and it has been delayed continuously. Now, please remember something and you will see there are almost no exception to this rule. There is a pattern that you should realize. The pattern is whenever there is an infrastructure project that does not involve China, but involves other countries, usually those projects are very slow to take off. Because in case when China is not really the funder of the project, they are not the person who is spending the money, they are not the nation spending the money, other countries don't have so much free cash to spend money. Especially when India also is a member of those groups, you will see that the funding remains a challenge always. On the other hand, when China is one of the countries in the group, you will see that the project goes on at a very, very fast pace. Now, this INSTC project, it started, the idea started in the year 2000, but because whenever you have a project with multiple countries involved, 
Like this project has total of 13 countries involved now. The problem is when you have 13 countries involved or so many countries involved, you have to take permission from each and every one. Even if one of the countries says no, then the project will not go ahead. And India being the very end country here, we want all the countries to say yes, only then we would be at an advantageous position. The second problem here is unlike India, what happens is in many other countries, once the government changes, once the government changes, the new governments usually don't like the earlier projects and then they shut it down. In India, thankfully, that doesn't happen. In India, as we discussed yesterday as well, in India, usually when you see the government of India, doesn't matter which party is in power, which party is not in power, usually the projects keep on moving forward. But in other countries, whenever the new parties come to power, they will see that the projects are delayed, that were the projects a top priority for the last government. Now, why is it in the news now? Why are we discussing this right now? We are discussing this right now because now what has happened is Russia and Iran have signed a deal. Russia and Iran have signed a deal. Vladimir Putin is saying that Russia will invest money to build a 162 kilometer railway line called the Rasht Astara railway line. That will be a part of this project. This is why it is in the news. It was not in the news for many years now. All of a sudden now because Iran has always been under US sanctions for a long time. Russia is also under US sanctions now. So these two countries are coming together and they have decided that we will make a railway line. And this agreement was just signed a few days back. This is why the project has again come back in the news. Now for India, why is it important? Using this route, India can have 30% cheaper transportation cost from Russia and 40% shorter distance as compared to the traditional route. That is why it is so, so, so important for India, especially at a time when we are importing so much oil from Russia that when these kind of routes actually become functional, it will be very, very helpful for India. Not just Russia, this project also gives India connectivity to the Central Asian nations. If you look at the Central Asian nations, Central Asian nations are extremely, extremely rich in a lot of mineral resources. Kazakhstan, etc. has largest, one of the largest reserves of uranium, gold, etc. And India can help or India can take advantage of that connectivity. Now, this is the route that is being talked about. That is, we just talked about this railway line that is the Astara Rasht railway line. So, this is the railway line that you will have. So, this is Rasht, this is here. The Rasht Astara railway line will be right here. It's just adjacent to the Caspian Sea, somewhere here. This railway line will be built so that there is enough connectivity from the Caspian Sea as well. From Iran, the next destination would be India. So it allows us to bypass Pakistan. It allows us to bypass countries such as China, etc. as well. It allows us to make sure that we are connected to Russia and to the Central Asian countries in a much, much better way. This is the Rasht Astara link that is in the news. Under this, Iranian railways will be connected with Azerbaijan's railways through the Russian technology. There are some problems here with this as well because Russia said that they will invest $1.73 billion. But the problem is Russia's railway technology is very different to how Iran railways works. So although on one hand, we do have this kind of a project where Russia has promised to Iran, that we will invest and we will expand your railway network. But the problem here is, as I said, Russia's railway technology is not really compatible with Iran. One other thing what India wants is, India wants this project to include the Chabahar port as well. Right now, this project does not include Chabahar port because it is a port where India has invested heavily. We want this project to be connected to the Chabahar port as well. So it remains to be seen whether this will happen or not. As I said, there are challenges. Challenges first being that this railway line may not really be up to the mark because the project has been delayed for a long time anyway. Russia has promised to invest but again the way that their railway technology works is very very different from that of Iran. Not just this, Iran-Azerbaijan relations are also not that great. Azerbaijan for a long time has been saying that Iran interferes in their regional politics. Iran is interfering in their internal matters. So even bringing Iran and Azerbaijan closer will be a challenge. As I said, the bottom line remains the fact that 
when you have so many countries in a single project 13 countries in a single project you will have an issue that you want all the countries to come together and say yes and even if one of them says no it will be very very problematic for india instc is extremely important as i said it will allow india to have much better trade with russia with central asian nations india wants a project to be connected to chabar port as well india things that we would be able to export a lot more stuff to central asia a lot more perishable products especially which have a shorter shelf life which have to be transported quickly and this is why india is also excited about this project since a very very long time this was a third article from the mains point of view let me quickly take a few more comments before we move on to the prelim specific news stories Chabhar port is not included, what type of difficulty will India face? It's not that we'll face difficulty, just that in Chabhar port, since India has invested a lot of money, so India controls a lot of operations of Chabhar port as well. And that is why we want the Chabhar port to be included here. It's not that if Chabhar port is not included, India will not be happy with this. Just that with Chabhar port, India has one more point here, so India will be happy with this. It's not that a disadvantage will happen if that's not included, it will be just an added advantage. Ankit Singh, will Pakistan also join INSTC in future? Ankit, unfortunately, sorry to tell you, but I don't know the future. So if someone knows the future, they can tell you. I don't know the future, so I don't know in future who will join, who will not join. Uh, again, question about Pakistan. I don't know if they will get involved in future or not because no one knows the future. Full stop. So let's put an end there. Kishan is saying recently Saudi Arabia announced an underwater railway line to India. Um, can it mitigate this problem? Which problem? I'm not sure what you're talking about. And will it get an advantage to enter Europe via positive opportunity cost? I am not sure how connectivity to India will result in advantage. It will result in connectivity to Europe. I'm not sure. Maybe you'll you'll have to frame this in a better way. If they are being connected to India, how will is how will it make sure that their connectivity or they they enter Europe? Not sure what you're asking. Maybe you'll have to reframe that once again. Okay, let me scroll down and uh, see. Okay. Does CPC hamper INSTC? No, CPC is what China, Pakistan, neither China nor Pakistan are a part of INSTC. So how will it hamper them? Let's move on then. There are some news stories from the prelims point of view as well. First of all, from the front page. In the front page, there was a news story that Kerala is trying to make sure that they counter the flooding of Chinese products into India. They want that tourists coming into China, tourists coming into Kerala, tourists coming into India should buy products that are made in Kerala only. So, Kerala Curios. Now, what is Curios? Any idea? So, basically, Curios is a word that means some exciting gift or a box of surprise. So, a box of surprise or a box of exciting gift, that is what you usually call Curios. So if you are, let's say, excited, this is what you usually mean. So Kerala is trying to ensure that this surprise or this kind of, uh, let's say, a gift that someone wants to buy, people should buy it especially from Kerala rather than actually buying it from China. That the, That's the stuff that is made from machines. Kerala is a very interesting case study in the sense that Kerala's tourism department has actually initiated a lot of very, very interesting different types of initiatives. So, uh, it's, I think someone wrote in the chat as well. So, you all know, would have heard this phrase, God's own country, right? Kerala, God's own country. Now, this is not a tag that someone has given to it to them. This was a campaign that Kerala Tourism started. So, Kerala Tourism Department, they started that. They are the ones who actually started this. They said that we will call ourselves God's own country and that has just stuck with them. It's not a tag given from anyone to them. And after that came up that tagline or that project started by Kerala Tourism, 
Kerala has been a tourist hub even more so after that. Now what has happened is Kerala Tourism has launched one more initiative called Kerala Souvenir Network under which what they are trying to do is make sure that people who come here buy souvenirs that are made from by the people of Kerala that are made by hand rather than actually going and depending on cheaper Chinese alternatives. There is also an initiative called Kerala Responsible Tourism Society. The Kerala Responsible Tourism Society is encouraging handicraft workers, handicraft artists to make stuff which is environment friendly, to make stuff which is recyclable, to make stuff which is eco-friendly so that the souvenirs which people buy are something that people actually feel good about because increasingly a lot more people when they buy something from the market are buying so that they can also contribute to the well-being of the environment. So Kerala government is trying to make sure that these souvenirs etc are eco-friendly. The handicrafts artists are being encouraged to use those products which would not harm the environment. The problem here is the cost factor. Whenever any tourist or whenever you buy something from a country or from any place, cost is the first factor that you think about. If you have a machine made product that is coming at half or less than half of the cost, many people would tend to go with that rather than a handmade product. That is biggest challenge and that is which that is the challenge that the government of Kerala is trying to overcome. And yes, I am seeing a lot of things in the chat about curious and curious. Curious is different guys. Curious is different. This article is not about curious. This is, this is not a mistake that the Hindu would do in their front page. It's not that they will write the wrong spelling. It's a different word. Curious is a different word. It's not curious. Curious is something entirely different. So please don't do that mistake. It's not curious. Curious, as I said, is a kind of a, a surprise, a box, something that you're very surprised by, something that you're very, uh, that you want to see. This is what curious is. It's kind of a gift item. For example, you can say that I uh, have bought a curious item for you as a gift. Something like that. It, this is not curious. Curious is something very different. Please don't compare that with this. These are some of the souvenirs that are usually made in Kerala's uh, market. There are some people from Kerala right here. If you are not from Kerala, I would advise you to go and visit. Amazing place. A lot of places where you can actually go and visit. The responsible Kerala mission, as I said, it's a mission by the Kerala state government to turn their tourism industry into a responsible tourism industry. How are they going to do that? By making sure that whatever products they make are environmental friendly, whatever activities that they conduct are environmental friendly, they will also make sure that their economic, social and environmental responsibility is upheld. The Kerala Tourism Agency is also trying to give emphasis to women empowerment by giving them enough jobs as a part of the responsible tourism mission. All of these are a part of how government of Kerala is trying to attract more and more tourists. Please understand, tourist and tourism especially is one of the best ways for the government to earn money, to give employment to the people, to make sure that there is enough employment opportunities. And tourism is one sector where a lot of industries can actually survive altogether. There is a hotel industry, there are the industry, uh, people need car drivers, people need uh, people need different types of uh, tourists, tourist guides, etc. Then there are places where you can sell stuff. There are security guards that you would need. So tourism is one industry on the basis of which the economy can get a huge boost. There are many countries in the world that whose entire economies are running on tourism. Look at Sri Lanka. Look at Maldives, look at Mauritius, look at Seychelles. All these industries, all these countries are running mainly on tourism only. And India, being such a diverse country, should have much, much more tourism. You have to understand this. There are not many other countries like India where you can actually come to one country, see the deserts also, see the hot desert also in Rajasthan, see the cold desert also in Ladakh, see the uh, rainforest also in the Western Ghats. You can see the highest of peaks in the world as well. So there are not many countries which can offer you all these. You can see the beaches as well. Most countries around the world, if they have one kind of a climate, it's just that climate all throughout the year. But in India, that is not really the case. 
So our tourism sector is still underutilized and it has to be exploited much, much more. The next article that we have here is about the global polio targets which would not be met right now because there are some countries where polio cases are again coming up. Around the world, if you see, there are two countries which are still considered as the hub of polio cases. The two countries are in India's neighborhood only, Pakistan and Afghanistan. These are the two countries where still we have a lot of polio cases. In 1988, the World Health Assembly established something called the Global Polio Eradication Initiative. There are three types of polio viruses. Type 2 and Type 3 have been eradicated. Please remember, out of 1, 2 and 3, Type 2, Type 3 have been eradicated. The only one that is left is polio virus type 1. Pakistan and Afghanistan are the only countries where we still have this polio virus. Last year, we saw 22 cases in Pakistan. There were about some other cases in Afghanistan as well. These are the two countries that still have polio. That is why, do you know, even today, when any, even an adult comes into India from Pakistan or Afghanistan, at the airport, when they land, they are first given the polio vaccine. They have to first take the polio vaccine, only then they can enter India. And it's not just India, in most countries around the world, when you are going from Pakistan, Afghanistan, you land to these countries, they'll first give you the polio vaccine and only then you can come up. So again, this shows that the entire world is working hard to eradicate polio, but in these two countries, it still exists. The problem here is, since we have such a connected world right now, no disease can get restricted to one single country. If a disease exists in Pakistan, Afghanistan, it will go to other parts of the world as well. The same happened with Ebola, the same happened with COVID-19 as well. This is why it is the entire world's responsibility to eradicate it. Now, there's something very interesting that you should know. India is a polio-free country, right? You all know India doesn't have polio right now. But the issue is, even though we are a polio-free country, we still have some polio cases. Well, how is that possible? And also tell me, Okay, I'll let, let me give this to you as a homework. First, you have to tell me how a country gets the tag of being a polio-free country. What is the criteria for how many time or for how much time you cannot have a polio case, number one. Second is, just search about how is it that India still has polio cases, but India still remains a polio-free country. How is that possible? Because these are contradictory things. We still have some polio cases, but India is a polio free country. How is that possible? Just think about that because there is a loophole in that criteria. Do search about it. It is important for you to know and do search about how a country gets the tag of being a polio free country. How did we get the tag from the WHO? The next article is about those people who want to have a lot of Diet Coke and Black Pepsi and have sugar free in their tea thinking that it will not harm them. WHO has some bad news. WHO is saying that even those who are taking non-sugar sweeteners, even those who are having sugar-free in their tea or in their food or in their Pepsi Coke, even that would actually harm you. In the long run, even that is not a really healthy alternative. WHO researchers have found out that non-sugar sweeteners should not be used for controlling weight or for reducing your non-communicable diseases. These are also bad for you in the long run. Now, how exactly do these sweeteners work? Basically, the simple idea of a sweetener is these sugar free, etc. That your body is not able to absorb them. So you eat it and your tongue feels that sweet taste. So your mind thinks you're eating sugar. But when you consume it, your body is not able to absorb those. So that just goes out of your body without being absorbed. That is the idea of sugar-free products such as aspartame, saccharin. Both of these work in this manner only. That your body cannot really ab uh, absorb this. You will taste it in your tongue and it will just go out. That is how it works. However, over here the WHO says that is not true. WHO says that higher intake of non-sugar sweetener has led to 76% increase in the risk of obesity. It has also led to BMI increase of 0.14 kg. That is a long term impact of having consumed these sugar fees or these kind of products time and time again. In India also, we should worry about this because in India, as per 
the national health and family survey one in nine women are obese and one in 25 men are obese this is why india also should understand this and as per the article our policy maker should also make laws even people should be discouraged to have sugar free because it's not just about having sugars even the sugar free can have a negative impact on your body who recommend that in place of these things you can replace this with something natural and just water if you want to consume some diet coke etc have water that will be much much better that is what who says now usually whenever you say sugar free or what product do you use as sugar free there are mainly two alternatives one you use saccharin and other you use aspartame these are the main alternates to sugar both of these work in the same manner you have it consume it your tongue has that sweet taste for a bit but your body does not absorb it so it is not really absorbed in your body and that is why you think that your body is not taking in that sugar this saccharin came up in 1879 it's the oldest non nutritive sweetener this is usually used to sweeten candies drinks and toothpaste as well on the other hand aspartame also came up around the same time aspartame is usually unstable for cooking temperature so it is only used in soft drinks and cold food so if you want to use something in a higher temperature when you increase temperature while cooking you go with saccharin otherwise for drinks etc you go with aspartame but again ideally as per who you should go with none of them have as much natural consumption as possible the last article that we have here is from indian polity the supreme court has said that just because the government of india has signed a contract in the name of the president of india doesn't allow the government of india to break that contract by saying that we have complete immunity you all have read in indian polity the president of india has been given immunity during his tenure however just because the government has signed a contract with a country or with any company in the name of president of india that doesn't mean that the government of india says that we can break the agreement also nothing will happen to us this is what has happened here the supreme court has said there is no immunity for president as a contract party so there is an ongoing case right now between the government of india and glock asia pacific limited it's a company there is an argument going on the company is saying that the government of india has not respected the contract that we have signed the government of india is saying that it doesn't matter because it is in the name of the president of india president has immunity so we also have complete immunity here not just this the company is also saying that we need to have an arbitrator in order to resolve this issue in the contract arbitrator means someone who comes in between the two parties arbitrates or negotiates and brings the both to the same conclusion the government of india wants the arbitrator to be their secretary only the government of india wants that their officer of the ministry of law should be the arbitrator in these contracts however the company obviously doesn't want an arbitrator who works for the government of india because that is now arbitration works arbitration means that the person should be unbiased should not be known personally to any of the two parties so supreme court has taken the side of the private company supreme court has said that we are appointing an arbitrator supreme court has appointed a retired supreme court judge justice indu malhotra as the arbitrator in this case and the supreme court also says that any contract name made by the government of india even if it is in the name of the president of india does not give complete immunity to the government the immunity that we have is personally for the president the immunity is not just that the government can do anything that they want so there is a difference between the two this is what immunity for president looks like it is mentioned article 361 of the indian constitution as you know president of india gets complete immunity from any criminal offense during his tenure the president cannot be punished for anything during his tenure however if there is a civil offense in his personal capacity let's say in his personal capacity there is a civil offense then there can be action taken against him after giving him a two month notice period but even then the president cannot be jailed for anything the president of india cannot be jailed for anything for his 
पर्सनल कैपेसिटी देर वॉज अ सिविल ऑफेंस देन एक्शन कैन बी टेकन आफ्टर अ टू मंथ नोटिस पीरियड बट अपार्ट फ्रॉम दैट यू कैन नॉट रियली हैव एनी जोरिजिक और एनी काइंड ऑफ लॉ और एनी काइंड ऑफ पनिशमेंट फॉर द प्रेजिडेंट ऑफ इंडिया आई हैव वन मोर क्वेश्चन फॉर यू डू यू नो देर वॉज अ गवर्नमेंट इन इंडिया दैट हैड इंट्रोड्यूस अ कॉन्स्टिट्यूशनल अमेंडमेंट इन दैट कॉन्स्टिट्यूशनल अमेंडमेंट दे हैड रिटर्न दैट एनी वन हु बिकम्स अ प्राइम मिनिस्टर और हु बिकम्स अ प्रेजिडेंट फॉर इवन वन सिंगल डे will have immunity throughout their lifetime not just 5 years the president the prime minister all of them will have immunity throughout their lifetime even if they become this or even if they hold this post for even one single day that uh, constitutional amendment thankfully was removed by the constitution of by the supreme court of india you have to tell me in the comment section after the video ends which constitutional amendment was that and which government introduced it which government introduced this amendment that even for one single day you become governor president prime minister even for one single day you get life long immunity when was it removed who introduced this what was the year do tell me in the comment section after the video ends thank you so much for joining in these are the couple of practice questions for all of you do try and answer this make sure that you join us tomorrow as well sharp at 10 am for the next session of the hindu news super analysis thank you so much bye bye have a good day jai hind